Watch this. One month after getting elected to the Central District Health Board of Directors, a complaint has been filed against Dr. Ryan Cole. So what does it mean and what happens next? The truth and tragedy, how an ICU staffer captured the raw emotion of working through the COVID crisis and the emotional toll it takes. The late night and national TV hosts had quite the time with Idaho Governor Brad Little and Lieutenant Governor Janice McGeehan. It's the latest in their feud. Well, the Idaho Medical Association is calling for an investigation into Dr. Ryan Cole of Boise. If his name sounds familiar, it's because Dr. Cole, who's a pathologist, he was recently voted to the Central District Health Board of Directors as its lone medical physician member. Now, as we've reported, Dr. Cole has called the COVID vaccine, quote, needle rape and has publicly advocated for the use of ivermectin, which is an unproven method to treat coronavirus. Now, last week, Dr. Stephen Coates, who's the president of the Idaho Medical Association Board of Trustees, as well as Susie Keller, the CEO of the Idaho Medical Association, well, the pair, they sent a letter to the Idaho Board of Medicine asking them to investigate Dr. Cole. Now, in the letter, they say, quote, Dr. Cole has made numerous public statements in 2020 and 2021 concerning COVID-19 that are at significant odds with commonly understood medical treatment of COVID-19 and fail to meet the community standard of care. It goes on to say, we believe many of those statements to be profoundly wrong, unsupported by medical research and collected knowledge, and dangerous if followed by patients or members of the public. Many of those statements have advocated that people not be treated appropriately and undoubtedly have led to and will continue to lead to poor health outcomes as people are encouraged not to be vaccinated against COVID-19 or obtain appropriate treatment for it when such treatment could improve their health. Taken as a whole, Dr. Cole's statements and actions have significantly threatened the public health and, in our view, are erroneously irresponsible and injurious to the public. Again, reading there from their statement. But they say that the basis for their complaint isn't his statements or his views, but that quote says that he has treated patients from Florida to California by refusing to use accepted and documented medical practices and vaccination instead of prescribing ivermectin, while he has criticized those who advocate vaccination against COVID-19 for violating their ethical obligation to first do no harm. In fact, he likely has violated that very ethical admonition by advising against vaccination and promoting the use of ivermectin instead. We believe his practice has described it himself is not in keeping with the Idaho community standard of care and does more harm than good. It should be stopped and quote again all of that from the statement. Now, this does not mean that Dr. Cole is under investigation, only that the Idaho Medical Association has asked for one. So what happens next? The complaint will be on the agenda at the next board of the Idaho Board of Medicine later this month. And at this point, members will decide if they want to recommend formal action or dismiss the complaint that you just heard as a whole. We did reach out to Dr. Cole for comment. We have not immediately heard back, but if we do and when we do, we will add his response to the story on our website, ktvb.com. Well, as COVID cases and hospitalizations continue to decline across the country, it is a very different story here in the gem state. Now, new numbers will not be released today because it is a federal holiday, but take a look at the latest numbers as of yesterday. State of Idaho is still backlogged about 8600 cases, so these numbers are going to be off until they can catch up processing all of those. You can see that we hit our all time high back on December 9th. Over 2200 COVID cases reported that day last year. In this latest surge, we hit our high on September 30th, over 1900 cases that day. And you can see that's where we've been hovering for the last few days. Let's take a look at the current hospitalizations in the state of Idaho. We hit our all time high back on September 24th, 796 Idahoans in the hospital at that time. But since then, you can see that we have started to slowly go down. Right now, we're just over 700 people in the hospital with COVID. It is important to note that not every hospital sends in their data to the Department of Health and Welfare on time, so the numbers you're looking at may actually be a little bit off, but they do tell the greater story as a whole. And last week, we passed a grim milestone with more than 3,000 deaths. 159 of those were reported in the last week alone. 
Well, as all that data implies, it is still incredibly challenging for our frontline health care workers as they fight through crisis standards of care statewide. It really is an experience tough to capture in words, but a cardiac nurse at St. Luke's did just that. And it didn't just resonate with frontline medical workers, but also helped people outside the medical community understand what they're going through and what they're seeing every day inside our ICUs. It is an experience we really cannot understand unless we're there. As time ticks away across the room, Sarah McDonald ticks away on her sculpture. We come here to make messes. Sometimes uh, pieces of artwork, definitely messes. The creations are crafted carefully. Every move made with purpose. My work is hugely emotionally charged. Sarah is also known as the sculptress Sarah Tops, with an impressive collection of pieces crafted from materials like copper and burnt wood. She takes great care, locking in the emotional arc for each individual piece. In recent months, it has certainly been more challenging to do that. It's hard. As an overnight nurse at St. Luke's working with cardiac patients, Sarah has seen the worst of COVID. Seeing one horrible thing, one horrible traumatic thing, and a lot of deaths after another, after another, after another, and you just kind of have to go, okay, well, I still have three sick patients. I got to get two. So you can't really stop and process it in the time. So it's just one trauma after another, after another, after another, after another, and it just keeps going. And you literally just keep going on to the next. That emotion I'm is not thankful. simply left at work. It seems silly, but I'm very thankful that my uh, life partner got a job on the other end of the state. Um, he moved at the beginning of August because it can't leave it at the door. It follows me home, you know? Sometimes it follows her here too. I'm not trying to plug into those, not here. So this place for me is, has been um, almost better than counseling. You know, I get to come here, my studio mates will check on me and say like, hey, how you doing? And if I need to talk, we can talk. If I don't want to talk, I just work in my corner on my projects. This environment helps keep Sarah going. I don't know that I could continue to go to my job if I didn't have this. But it doesn't filter out the emotions. She captured those with this. It's a long poem, you guys. A different medium, a poem of raw emotion. I am a COVID veteran. This is a different kind of war. A war some don't believe in, a war some mock, a hoax. The trauma is real. The dying is real. The night before I wrote that poem was just um, the hardest night I've ever had. Running from room to room, one after another, for seven hours straight, just um, putting out house fires, you know? There's a lot of staring at a clocks, just going, we just have to make it three more hours. I know you can't breathe. I know, I know it's uncomfortable. I know it's blasting air in your face. I'll gladly take it off. Just do me a favor, change your code status first. That hardest night stuck with Sarah. I woke up and that knot was still in my throat. So I just sat down at my computer and did a free write, which is where you just write your thoughts as they come out. and. There's no editing, there's no spell check. You're just getting them out as fast as they can. And that's what happened, so. And I, I felt a little bit better. On to the next, on to the next, on to the next until morning. We just have to make it till morning. We just have to make it while morning. We just have to make it still morning. We just have to make it on to the next. In earnest, Sarah and other healthcare workers continue to make the same point. They tell us this is not political for them. Medical leaders and frontline healthcare workers see firsthand the difference in patients and how much better a large majority of vaccinated people do against COVID compared to their non-vaccinated counterparts. Now, Sarah said for her, it's, it's really not about left or right or politics. It's about keeping the community healthy in relieving the stress on frontline workers. 
Medical experts will tell you, get a vaccine. They are safe and effective. Late night and national media outlets are picking up on the Little McGeehan feud. And as you could assume, they have a lot to say about it. Roll the tape. Idaho, that's not how a lieutenant governor is supposed to take over. We know you probably have something you'd like to say too. And guess what? You can say it directly to us via text message. Our number, 208-321-5614. Text us what's on your mind, your questions, your comments, your complaints, whatever you want. Just make sure to include your name and hashtag the 208. We'll share as many of your message as we can on air at the end of the show. Well, last week was a big week for Idaho on the late night and talk show scene, and it wasn't in a, hey, look, Idaho did something awesome kind of way. It was more of a, oh, look, Idaho national news again in that kind of way. And this after another feud between the Lieutenant Governor Janice McGeehan and Idaho Governor Brad Little. All this after Little left the state for a business trip down to the southern border. And that's when McGeehan, who assumed the role of acting governor in his absence, decided to issue her, her, issue her own executive order on vaccine mandates. We routed up just a few of the talk show segments from John Oliver to Stephen Colbert and CNN. Just take a listen. In Idaho, an extraordinary public feud between the state's two top leaders took a bizarre turn this week. And in Idaho, there was this dramatic power grab. Case in point, this week, Idaho's governor left the state, so his lieutenant governor took power and banned state vaccine mandates. Idaho, that's not how a lieutenant governor is supposed to take over. Lieutenant Governor Janice McEachin signed an executive order banning vaccine mandates in schools and COVID testing in certain capacities. The problem is the governor, Brad Little, was out of the state when she did it and quickly promised to undo the order. See, there was a meeting of Republican governors in Texas, attended by Idaho governor and the stud muffin of FarmersOnly.com. <laughs> Brad Little, while Governor Little was out of state, power was then seized by Lieutenant Governor and woman who swears to tell the tooth, the whole tooth, and nothing but the tooth, <laughs> Janice McGeehan. And the thing is, in Idaho, the lieutenant governor does technically become acting governor whenever the actual governor leaves the state, thanks to a state constitution that was definitely written long before cell phones existed. And if both of them are out of state, power passes to a potato with googly eyes. <laughs> yeah, that's true. While the Idaho governor was out of state, his lieutenant governor issued an executive order trying to ban schools from requiring employees to be vaccinated. And not just that, she also sent the state National Guard a query about activating troops and sending them to the US-Mexico border, <laughs> which is a pretty bold move from a second in command. It's basically a plane's pilot going to the bathroom and the co-pilot announcing, change of plans, we're headed to Reno. <laughs> My buddy said he'd set me up with a cousin of his if I was ever there and I saw a picture of her and she's an absolute smoke show, so strap in, folks. It's it's going to be bumpy on purpose. Now, oh, no. if you're wondering why these two Republicans are feuding, well, in Idaho, 
the governor and lieutenant governor don't run on the same ticket. And in the next election, McGeehan is running for governor. She's gunning for her boss's job. Mm. That's like a babysitter watching the parents drive off and going, kids, call me mommy. We caught up with McGeehan outside her office. But you know what you're doing. You're running for governor. And when he leaves town, you're issuing these, these orders. You're undermining what he's doing when you're doing this. You know, I, you, you're, I'm not going to talk anymore to an activist. I'm, if you're asking me fair questions as a reporter, then that's fine. But if you're well, going to be an activist, I'm, I'm... I'm not being an activist. But what do you say to your critics who say that this is absurd? Again, you're being an activist. I am not anti-vax. I am not anti-testing of COVID. We know a lot of people that are suffering from this right now. But I am very much against having it be a mandate in our state. And that's what this is all about. People should not be forced to decide to but he never something. mandated anything. The governor okay. ne never mandated anything. Interview's over. This is the only uh, lieutenant governor that I can recall that has acted like an idiot. Some very strong words from Jim Jones, a former Supreme Court justice for the Idaho Court of, excuse me, the Supreme Court of Idaho. Um, less than 10 minutes after announcing her executive order, Governor Little responded saying that he would rescind any order by McGeehan, which he did. Um, you heard Dan say this is actually the second time the lieutenant governor has issued an executive order as acting governor. We told you this in May, she issued an executive order banning mask mandates across the state, even though Governor Little has never mandated masks during the pandemic. He also rescinded that executive order as well. Meanwhile, Lieutenant Governor McGeehan is expected to appear in court later this week on possible contempt of court charges after she failed to comply in time with that a timely manner. However, the Idaho Press Club, which asked the judge to bring charges against McGeehan, has asked the judge to drop those charges as well. But the judge must still sign off on that. We will, of course, keep you posted on all of it. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. In 2019, Idaho Governor Brad Little changed things up a bit, marking today as a day that Idahoans celebrate the original inhabitants of this land we now call home. Text us what you want to see more of on the 208. This is, after all, a show for Idahoans by Idahoans, and you can text us Idahoans anytime. 208-321-5614. Just be sure to include your name and hashtag the 208. And make sure you save this number. Text us anytime. Questions, comments, whatever you want. You may see your comments at the end of the show.
incredible fall scenes and a lot of those pictures being shared on our Idaho Weather Watchers group on Facebook. We love all of those pictures being shared, so thank you for sending them in. Current temperatures about 10 degrees cooler than where our highs were yesterday, but I think more noticeable than the cool down in most spots, the wind that's been with us today. In fact, our wind gusts are up above 40 miles per hour in many spots, including Ontario and Caldwell. If you drove on I-84 today, you might have felt the vehicle kind of bobbling around a little bit. So stronger wind through the western part of the state, even up through McCall, dealing with the gusty wind. The wind advisory remains in effect until 9 p.m. tonight and still for some scattered snow showers in our central mountains. The winter weather advisory is posted until 6 a.m. tomorrow for some light accumulation, some beautiful scenes in our central mountains blanketed by snow overnight last night. Some scattered showers through the Wood River Valley and also down through the Magic Valley. Snow showers still hanging around through eastern Idaho, but for us here in the Treasure Valley and up through the west central mountains, we're, we'll continue to see the clouds breaking apart through the overnight hours and we'll get a lot of sunshine back tomorrow. Not as much wind, but the wind will still be with us. A blustery breeze is what I'm calling it in comparison to the gusty blustery wind of today. Clouds roll back into place on wind Wednesday, and that's when we see our next chance for a quick little sprinkle or a shower in the afternoon or evening hours on Wednesday, but it's not a lot of rain on the way. Just a quick little sprinkle, maybe enough raindrops to count on one hand. I think the bigger headline for the weather forecast today is the freeze warning that's been posted. It is a freeze warning posted for tomorrow morning through the Western Magic Valley and for the Treasure Valley on Wednesday morning. This is no reason to panic and think, oh, my sprinkler system isn't blown out just yet. It's more of a garden warning. Morning. So if you need to do that final harvest of the garden today would be a good time to do it. Temperatures for the Magic Valley tomorrow certainly will be sub freezing and then into Wednesday morning for the Treasure Valley will be at freezing or just below. Here's a look at the seven day forecast. You could cover those sensitive plants up, but you'd have to do so through the next several nights as we're expecting freezing mornings through Friday. You can always find a fresh forecast at KTVB.com. Well, today is technically Columbus Day, a federal and state holiday celebrating the landing of Christopher Columbus in the Americas in, uh, in 1492. But two years ago, Governor Brad Little signed a proclamation designating the second Monday in October today as Indigenous Peoples Day. For those of you who are new in Idaho, here's a little history for you. Today, there are five federally recognized tribes within Idaho. The Shoshone Bannock, the Paiute, the Nez Perce, Coeur d'Alene and Kootenai now, most currently live on one of the five Native American reservations in the state. You're looking at a map that shows their homelands and the lands they eventually ceded to the U.S. government. As of today, the Idaho State Historical Society says those tribes own over 963,000 acres of land in Idaho. Before it became a statewide holiday, the city of Moscow was the first city in Boise, excuse me, in Idaho to recognize Indigenous People Day in 2017. I should have said in Idaho. Now the city of Boise followed in 2018. 10 states officially observed the holiday, including Oregon, Alaska, Hawaii, and South Dakota.
Take a look at some comments, questions, thoughts. Here we go. This one unnamed. It says, what does McGeehan mean by asking the reporter if he's an activist? Back to the segment we did about CNN coming to talk to Janice McGeehan, um, not specifically in this situation, but as an overall theme. When politicians in recent years have accused a reporter, asked a reporter if they're an activist, it's implying that they're there to support one side or the other, and they're not there independently seeking truth. So that's what likely she means by activist. You'd have to ask her, though, uh, to find that out exactly. But in general terms, that's what I believe she means. Charlie says, is there any particular demographic that is being hospitalized? Who are they and are healthcare officials targeting them? Uh, Charlie talking about COVID here. Uh, we do know that like the previous surge, the older folks are having more complications with COVID. However, new info from our medical leaders in recent weeks and months COVID is now really having a bad effect on younger and younger patients. So in terms of targeting one group right now during crisis standards of care, Idaho medical workers and frontline health care workers are doing their absolute best just to help everyone. Uh, finally here, some really kind words for uh, Sarah McDonald, who spoke with us earlier in the show. And a shout out to all frontline health care workers. You are valued. We care about you. Thank you for your hard work. We'll see you guys tomorrow.